And uh, that's that's exactly what we're facing right now, where you have a tsunami's worth of deflationary forces pent up, just waiting to be for some catalyst to be unleashed. It's like we built the biggest dam in the world. And a flood has just happened. There's big rains happening. And so we've got all these deflationary forces pushing against the economy. And what you have to do to counteract that is uh, build up the inflationary forces exponentially higher. Um, and at some point you risk that that tightrope has gotten tighter and tighter and tighter as time has gone on as the more we've been doing this. And you're you, at some point it disappears. But if even if it doesn't disappear, you make a policy error, you tip over into deflationary death spiral or you tip over into hyperinflation. And it's just a matter of time. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Welcome to the Gold Republic Podcast. My name is Bart Brons. And I'm Alexei Jordanov. In our weekly podcast, we invite guests from all over the world to get valuable insights into the emergence of a new monetary system through the lens of precious metals, cryptocurrencies, and other financial instruments. Uh, now, moving on to the next topic, um, there's right now the, the, the situation in which uh, the U.S. Uh, House of Representatives uh, just passed with uh, a motion from the Democrats um, the um, suspension of the debt limit to 2022. Uh, first of all, um, what does this imply? And um, second of all, if, and this is basically being decided, uh, if understood well, um, until a deadline, which is the 30th of September in a few days, um, what would this imply in in a bigger grand scheme of things because there's also a risk there's two pressures there's one the spending of uh, basically the the budget that the the, the state has to basically pay uh, um, for the paychecks uh, for everything like outstanding debts all of that but also in general the the solvability of uh, the state itself uh, so that would be the first time the 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 US would be basically defaulting ever um, and that's not really an option <laughs> and it's not good for, for everyone. Uh, so how do you basically see that? So how do I see that playing out? Well, number one, I think this bill that just passed uh, the House, the, I think it was this morning, um, the I think it's dead in the water. Uh, we'll see. But uh, the Senate Republicans have vowed uh, to uh, uh, to vote against it. The reason for that is because the Democrats can uh, uh, do this by themselves through a process called reconciliation. I don't understand the process fully myself, but basically it means that the Democrats can do it by themselves. It's just politically unpopular to vote for this right now. And so Republicans are saying, hey, you're, you have the majority. You can do this by yourselves. And with elections coming up soon, we don't want this to be on our uh, recent record. So we're just going to force your hand because it has to be done. Um, and everybody understands this. And so it's like, you know, we're, we're playing chicken with each other. Now, let's say that. Uh, um, and so in my opinion, what's going to happen is the very last minute, they'll, the Democrats will get it done through reconciliation. And maybe they only, you know, suspend it through the end of the year and then have to, you know, come up with another solution for, you know, 2022. I don't know. I think that's what's going to happen, though, is that they're going to do it by themselves. Let's just say, though, like you said, what happens if they don't? Let's say, you know, they play chicken, you know, a little bit too long and uh, we do default. Um, this is something. So when it first started, uh, when Janet Yellen first uh, presented to Congress and said, hey, you guys, you know, this is. It's very important that you get this solved because uh, we can't default. Um, I made a video on that, and uh, I'm not sure if you guys uh, know uh, Peter Schiff, but he made a comment uh, to me that, hey, that, this isn't actually true, where I said that, uh, uh, that, that the United States had never defaulted. And uh, technically, that's not actually true because uh, uh, under the Bretton Woods Agreement, uh, the dollar was redeemable by other countries, not by people but by other countries with gold. And that was a legal contract. And when everybody around the world realized that we didn't have enough gold to uh, back up our contracts that we had signed with everybody around the world, then some countries uh, looked at it and said, you know what? We're just going to go get our gold. So everybody said, you legally owe us this gold by this contract that states this dollar is redeemable in gold. That was the agreement. And so they went to make good on that agreement and the United States didn't have enough gold. And so uh, we uh, we did technically default on that by redefining what a dollar is. And so we closed the gold window. That was that was a violation of the contract to uh, pay back the gold that we had borrowed from the rest of the world. 
and we redefined the word dollar instead of as a weight of gold, we redefined it as a piece of paper with the number one printed on it. Um, so if we avoided the, I guess, the legal definition of defaulting because we said originally we'll pay you back in a dollar. We just changed the definition of a dollar from a weight of gold to a piece of paper. And so, but now the there's there wouldn't be that option to avoid a uh, a a legal default because um, there's a, a there's a, a a legal process in place that says hey if the treasury runs out of money well you, 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 in order to make your payments of you know paying out to to the military paying your uh, principal and your interest on your debt to the rest of the world it's all digital but you still have to credit those dollars if you don't credit those dollars to them for that repayment then that is by definition a default and so um, if that were to happen. That's something that could, that's one of those events that we talked about earlier, what could trigger, you know, yield curve control, purchasing stocks, what's a cataclysmic event that could start this whole process unwinding. That is definitely one of them, a United States default that could immediately unthrown, dethrone the uh, the dollar from a global reserve currency status. Now, the Federal Reserve has a contingency in place where they would basically step in for the government and uh, fulfill those obligations on their behalf and start printing the money and sending it out on their behalf. Um, and that's a complete violation of the Federal Reserve Act and, and uh, you know, the boundaries that were put in place to prevent something like this from happening. Uh, but uh, in any case, it looks like they're planning to do that should it should it come to it. And so we may avoid a cataclysmic event, even if the government would technically default because the Federal Reserve might step in because they have the power to print dollars. They might step in in, in place. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll have to wait and see how that how that unfolds. <laughs> Um, yeah, that would be also like a first. I mean, th there was such also downgrade. I think in uh, uh, under in 2011 under President Obama, where there was a first downgrade, self-inflicted wound, as uh, Jay Paul said at the time. Um, um, and ba and basically that would also mean that the whole full devaluation of uh, the dollar uh, decreases in asset prices and all kinds of other uh, really nasty things. Uh, also, like just uh, the collapse of uh, some form of the financial system itself. But how how really likely is it? Uh, because now we're just flirting with the hypothesis. But uh, are there like real implications this time? I know that the subject always comes every year or every few years where the the government shutdown is there. So can be paid you see it all over the news and then there's this political downplay the democrats the republicans and they all yell at each other and then it's again but will there be maybe a point where yeah. this is not possible anymore because as we've seen there's sometimes forces and so so much complexity in the system that just doesn't allow it of any room for maneuver anymore yeah, well, that's that's one of the things that we see happening right now is that there's just there are so many more problems today, uh, financially speaking, and and then the other problems that are a result of that um, compared to you know ten years ago when all they had to decide was are we going to bail out the banks or twelve years ago um, versus you know ten years before that when all they had to decide was are we going to lower interest rates to uh, stop the stock market from falling as a result of the dot com bubble bursting. Um, and so every time you do something like this, it plants the seeds for, uh, you know, way more problems in the future. It's like forest fire. You have to have those small burns to burn up the deadwood because that uh, contributes to a, a nutritious uh, ground soil. It deposits that uh, nitrogen in the ground for flourishing later on. But if you don't allow those fires to happen, what happens is all that deadwood builds up. And then when a fire does eventually come, because it will eventually come, you cannot put it out and it burns so hot that it burns off the topsoil and you can't have growth moving forward for, for years or sometimes decades. You, you destroy the, uh, the, the livability of the ecosystem. And that's the same thing that happens in a financial ecosystem when you, uh, when you st stop those uh, small disasters from happening. Uh, through a variety of mechanisms, whether it's moral hazard or something else, for, through a variety of mechanisms, you plant the seeds for way more disaster to come up later. And so all the things that we see happening uh, around the world that are like, hey, why is this happening again? Like, why do we see so much civil unrest happening? Why do we see uh, over the last 50 years, there's only been an increase in the frequency of bank collapses and of financial crises and um, hyperinflation episodes and things like that? Those things are becoming more and more and more frequent over time. It's because, uh, you know, every time these things start to happen, they take the easy way out. And so 
you start to have uh, you start to have problems then that are uh, the the solutions are uh, kind of uh, against each other. And one of the uh, one of the um, examples of that is what's happening in China right now. Well, one of the uh, results of their growth of wealth is a big uh, uh, increase in inequality. And so in order to clamp down on inequality, he's trying to, Xi Jinping is trying to rain down on that moral hazard. And that's bringing down asset prices. That's bringing down real estate prices. But that's destroying a lot of the wealth that they created over the last 20 years. And uh, and so you have, uh, that you're, you're trying to walk this tightrope uh, to control economies from the top down. And that's not just in China, that's everywhere around the world. There are very few free markets left. But when you're trying to control economies from the top down, you have solutions that might fix one thing, but they cause more problems on the other side. And uh, that's that's exactly what we're facing right now, where you have a tsunami's worth of deflationary forces pent up, just waiting to be for some catalyst to be unleashed. It's like we built the biggest dam in the world. And a flood has just happened. There's big rains happening. And so we've got all these deflationary forces pushing against the economy. And what you have to do to counteract that is uh, build up the inflationary forces exponentially higher. Um, and at some point, you risk that that tightrope has gotten tighter and tighter and tighter as time has gone on, as the more we've been doing this. And you're you, at some point, it disappears. But if even if it doesn't disappear, you make a policy error, you tip over into deflationary death spiral, or you tip over into hyperinflation. And it's just a matter of time. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. What then is, you think, the, the most uh, plausible outcome? Because we've seen inflation. Uh, we've seen people saying that it's transitory. Well, first of all, is it transitory or isn't it transitory? And then the deflation versus inflation debate. It's a fascinating debate. And uh, there's a lot to say for both. What what is your uh, What is your analysis? Yeah, that's a great question. It's that's that's something that gets lost uh, if you don't look at the longer view of history. So uh, Jeff Booth has the I think the best way of describing deflation, which is getting more for less. It's basically technology. It is by definition what the growth of wealth is over time. It's bringing abundance to scarcity. And uh, if wealth couldn't grow on net. Over time, we'd all still be hunters and gatherers because wealth is measured in the gro in goods and services, the quality of life. And, and so we have a growth of that over time because we have been able to offload human labor to, we've been able to outsource that to other things, whether that's fire to cook food, we get more nutrition, have to hunt for food less, uh, whether that's animals who can do our labor for us so that they can help us farm, whether that's tractors, one tractor can do the farm work of hundreds of people. Those, these are all good things. A, an average person today, they they take an Uber home. They get inside. They say, "Hey Alexa, play my uh, you know playlist for me." They uh, order DoorDash for dinner. Uh, basically, 150 years ago, if you wanted that level of wealth, you would have had to have a full time sh uh, a chauffeur, a full time chef, a full time orchestra sitting downstairs in your uh, giant great room that would be willing to play any song 24 seven. So the amount of wealth that society has today is astronomically larger than it was 50, 100, 150 years ago, especially thousands of years ago. Um, and we get all of that for a lot less labor than we used to, obviously, because the labor that it would have taken to get that is, you know, it's impossible to get that today, uh, to, to do that labor, to get that amount of wealth today. And so that's what deflation is over time. You get more for less. And so we should be experiencing lower prices, but we have a system built on debt. And so if you have a system built on debt, and then you have deflation, well, that debt becomes so hard to pay off that it becomes impossible to pay off. And then prices uh, drop precipitously. And so in order to avoid that from happening, you need to print money to push up prices to make that debt service cost easier. And so what you have over history is you have long-term deflation where things get cheaper over time and you get abundance brought to scarcity over time and you have a growth of wealth over time measured by getting more for less. But you have these small periods of time, historically speaking, where you have prices skyrocket. And it starts off slowly where you have deflation slowing down. And then it starts where prices just kind of steady. And then after prices get steady, then prices slowly go up. And then you have, boom, hyperinflation that collapses. And then you get all the deflationary forces that have been pent up throughout that inflationary period. And a lot of times it takes decades for that isolated place where you had the hyperinflation to bounce back. Um, 
but eventually, eventually they do. And so uh, you look at, you know, Germany, right? Very, uh, very wealthy economy over the last couple of decades. They experienced hyperinflation back in the 20s. And so, you know, it, it takes it takes some time. But uh, ultimately, you can uh, ultimately it's not like, uh, a, you know, a, a complete it's not a death sentence. Basically, it's just you get all the all the deflation that you uh, you held at bay for years. It all crashes in at once. So I don't know exactly how that plays out. Nobody does. Uh, but my uh, my guess would be that it plays out similar to history, where instead of making the decision of allowing the deflation to happen now, because it's going to happen at some point, and the longer we wait, the worse it's going to get. Um, it, uh, instead of doing the politically unpopular but long term uh, more healthy decision, what's likely going to take place is an increase of the current policy, which is more printing, more delaying, more easing uh, until that gets to a point where uh, the currency is just not accepted anymore because it's lost its purchasing power. And then you get the deflationary uh, tsunami crashing over uh, uh, all that pent up deflation that you've had for decades. If I understood it well, and if I just reformulated, Joe, uh, it's a hot potato that politicians and also policymakers, um, and also through central banks' uh, monetary policies, are, are basically juggling with, and we don't really know when the sticking bump is is uh, going to explode. But when it does explode, and we've seen today, um, also you see it all over the news in the Netherlands here, especially we have natural gas spiking up like crazy. People in the street have never seen this before. We have in Europe two hundred fifty percent increase in energy. And next year, it's. I think Bart, you just told me before, it's even going to double on based on that. So it's maniac and everyone needs energy. If it's for producing or even uh, basically fueling uh, your home and, and just being staying warm over the winter. Winter is approaching as well. If it's a hard winter, oil prices might skyrocket as well. Uh, people won't be able to drive properly, go to work. So it's a really, it's a, it's a, it's a huge mess. Um, and it is hard for normal people, for average people, people that are not, let's say, financial savvy or that are not having the knowledge that most uh, people in the financial industry have to even know how do you protect yourself in this environment. Saving doesn't bring anything. It's even negative if you have above 100K. Um, what is your approach and what is also your philosophy based on hedging against those crises, which Heresy Financial is also all about? Yeah. Yeah, great question. Um, so a couple of things. Number one, um, these are these are some problems. Like for instance, the energy thing. Um, if you if you follow these problems back to the root cause, almost always you find the uh, the you find the money. You find the expansion of the money supply. One of the reasons that we have uh, uh, a a a lo localized lack of uh, energy in uh, in many places around the world is because you've had a uh, you've you've had regulations passed about what type of energy can be uh, created what type of energy can be uh, invested in um, what type of uh, um, uh, energy people or uh, industries or companies can use um, what the composition of that has to be and uh, these are decisions that um, uh, when you have uh, when you have complex decisions, there's there's no way for a centralized um, uh, uh, whether it's a computer, you know, we are talking about things in computer science, or whether you're talking about uh, economies or other things. When you have a, a, a decision that's complex enough, um, there's not enough computing power in a isolated, small, centralized node, let's say, to uh, to make a decision that uh, that works for the uh, for the system. And so the only way to get enough computing power in order to make the right decision for the system is to decentralize that choice across the entire system. This is the problem with pricing just in general across an economy because a price is information about the scarcity or abundance of that given good compared to the rest of the stock of goods and services. So you've got let's say global copper production and a copper mine goes down. And that year, let's say you've got 25% less copper production for that year. That year, you will have to have 25% less consumption of copper. You have to. You can't consume the same amount of copper. Um, or let, let's even say wheat, because wheat can't last or be recycled. Wheat is 100% on, on supply. You cut wheat supply by half, you'll have a, a one half 
uh, of, uh, of uh, consumption of wheat. You can't have it any other way. So the way that that works in free markets is that decision on who consumes less wheat, that decision is made by a decentralized mechanism of the entire system determining how much wheat to consume on an individualized basis. And the way that they make that decision is through the information conveyed to them by the price of that wheat. Because if the price of wheat doubles and I buy one loaf of bread a year, I'll still buy my loaf of bread. But if I buy a hundred loaves of bread a day because I'm a, I'm a, a restaurant, well, maybe I raise my prices and that causes less people to come buy sandwiches from me. And so I buy less bread as a result of that. And so prices being able to freely move is 100% necessary for uh, economies or systems uh, to uh, uh, price things and send the correct information about the scarcity and abundance of things uh, correctly in its system. And it is not possible in systems that are complex like that for a centralized decision maker to make a decision that is accurate compared to all of the needs of each individual person. It's far more effective to let the system, each individual in the system decide for themselves. And the only way they can do that accurately is if prices are able to freely move to convey the accurate information about abundance and scarcity versus all the other goods and services. So really roundabout, I promise I'll answer the question. (laughs) Relating to energy, that has not been allowed to take place. You have governments, centralized decision makers determining how energy is distributed. Relating to money, 50% of every transaction That is not allowed to take place. You have governments and central banks deciding what the cost of that money is. That's the price of money. That's what interest rates are. And so that's why you have places of scarcity of money showing up with the poor. You have places of abundance of money showing up with the credit worthy, which are the rich and the corporations. And so you have misallocations of resources and capital to take place across economies, across systems, when you have centralized decisions that are being made on a system that is scaled large enough. Um, I can make a decision about my family and and not have have it, you know, I can be a communist in my own family and not have that make, you know, be disastrous, right? Because there's four of us. It's not a big deal. But when you have hundreds of millions or billions of people, you can't do that. It's not possible. You have to decentralize those uh, those decisions across the system. And, uh, and and so that's why you have these shortages show up like in energy. And that's why you have these shortages and abundances uh, in other areas show up with uh, with things like money. And so um, and so that is the mechanism that is uh, that is causing these things to happen. You trace it back, trace it back to the money. Of course, uh, I think it's always good to talk about what problems we possibly face, analyze them. But it's also important important to talk about you know the the future behind because every crash ends in a new beginning and every new beginning uh, should be uh, something that we all hope is is very positive so we would like to end on a on a on a happy note and say you know how can we create that future that we all would like to have and that starts with yourself and your own investment perhaps possibilities, uh, what, what would you say should be some of the strategies to, to use when investing and creating that, that, well, that, that beautiful future for yourself and maybe your family? Yeah. Yeah. Well, just on a, on a positive note, um, if you look at, uh, something that, uh, uh, Matt really talks about a lot, you know, in his, especially in his recent book, how innovation works, uh, and many other, it's very well documented that the world is, gets better over time. We always have crises and the world still gets better over time. Now, isolated areas get worse. And a lot of times that lasts for a long time. Um, but the general trend of history has always been and likely will always be one that gets better, not worse. And um, and so this is back in the 1800s. I can't remember the exact quote and I don't even remember who said it. But um, he, he said, how is it that when we look to the past, the only thing we see is progress and things getting better? How is it then that when we look forward from the present to the future, all we can proclaim is disaster? It's like, well, clearly, you know, that then we're, we're probably looking at things the wrong way. And it's because we see our problems, but we don't see the long trend of history moving forward. And so that's, uh, it's important to remember that long term things get better. And even at many times, the pain and the disasters and the deflationary death spirals and the depressions and the recessions, those plant the seeds for better growth moving forward, even if it's not exactly where you are somewhere. 
And so that's the first thing is that things do get better over time. Wealth grows over time. Now, um, one of a couple strategies then to prepare yourself for that. Um, I think today more than ever, because it's like it's arguably easier more than ever, is to try and diversify geographically as much as possible. Um, that's that's very easy to do with your wealth, to open accounts in other places, uh, to have private vaults in other countries uh, where you store things like uh, Bitcoin or gold, um, to, di- to diversify your wealth geographically because there will be places that uh, get hurt And then make bad decisions and stay uh, hurt long term or longer term. Uh, But there will also be places and there are right now places that are not making bad decisions. And that's where the wealth is going to go. And they're going to have a lot more of the benefits long term. Um, And so diversifying geographically is huge. And then a lot of people always talk about diversifying your assets. And uh, most people don't know what that means because if you own an S&P 500 fund, you have 500 different stocks, you have zero diversification because your correlation between those 500 positions is one. It's 100%. They move together. They all go up together, down together. So you don't have diversification in that case. You, In order to be diversified, you have to have um, uncorrelated assets. True diversification, you need uncorrelated assets. And so um, when you look at, uh, when you look at uh, different asset classes, it is a good thing when you see, um, w- when you go back and you see oh, that that they don't that they don't correlate to uh, things that you thought that they should correlate to, so uh, things like gold are uncorrelated to. Um, uh, uh, so sometimes they're correlated to interest rates. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes gold is correlated to the money supply. Sometimes it's not. Uh, things like Bitcoin still a very uncorrelated asset. Um, many people say it's an inflation hedge. It's not an inflation hedge uh, because it does not uh, it does not provide the same level of uh, uh, correlation to uh, inflation as uh, you know it, it, very little correlation to inflation. So Bitcoin is not an inflation hedge, but it's an uncorrelated asset. So having it as part of your portfolio is it's it's a way to achieve diversification. Um, and then having uh, um, instead of uncorrelated, having negatively correlated assets uh, is uh, is a fantastic way to protect yourself as well. So when you see when you see things that typically move uh, opposite of one another, like a very easy example is buying a put on a stock. That way you have the insurance. If it goes to zero, you don't get wiped out. But if it continues to grind higher because of this monetary policy, you get to experience the upside. And so those are negatively correlated positions where if one goes down, the other goes up. Um, and so uh, being able to uh, uh, construct your portfolio in a way where you have positions that are not tied to each other, um, and then also geographically in countries that are uh, you know not tied to each other, is um, it, those are the two most important things to protect yourself going forward into the future. On the, fin- on the finishing note, um, what you, you just mentioned, uh, the potential of gold being basically kind of pressured down or held at very low levels and we've seen gold actually hoovering the 18 1800 level for for quite a quite a while now and it seems like it's also really undervalued compared to all kinds of other assets and especially in the commodities uh, uh, space how is it you've um how is it even possible what's your thesis behind it you've also talked about um well price manipulation for some reason that we've also explained linked to uh, central banks not being in their favor to have a, a high uh, gold price. What is your thesis behind this? Yeah, great question. I'm not a I'm not a uh, uh, trader of gold. Um, I'm a long term holder of gold. So uh, the to the extent that there's manipulation, I like it because I get to buy it uh, periodically for cheaper than I would absent that manipulation. Now, the manip- anytime you have manipulation, it doesn't last long term. It has to end at some point and put the and the price goes back to fair value. Just like when you 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 know recently we had the the GameStop squeeze, AMC squeeze. There is too high of a short interest, and those shorts have to close out. That's buying pressure that drives the price up. So same type of thing happens. 
happens with uh, happens with gold long term. You do have a high short interest in gold. That's not like illegal manipulation. Spoofing doesn't cause long term uh, long term price uh, uh, changes. Short term, sure. Long term, no. Uh, the short interest is high right now, which means that when that closes out and goes back to a more normal level, the price of gold, uh, all else being equal, would go up. Long term, though, I'm I'm very okay with where the gold price is right now. Um, it's it's down since its peak last August, but uh, year to date, it's only down I think six percent as of today. Um, since uh, since the beginning of last year, it's it's up I think I don't know like 20% or something like that. Um, there, there's a, a very short amount of time historically where the gold price has been higher than what it's at today. Um, also, when you look at the price of gold versus the money supply since about 1976, um, after the price of gold was able to adjust uh, uh, freely for the market, um, it is, it's still today kept up very adequately with the uh, broad money supply. Uh, maybe it has a little bit of catching up to do compared to the broad money supply, but it's kept up very adequately. And that's large in part due to the massive rise we had from like 20, the bottom in 2015 to the top in August of last year. And, uh, and so since then, it's been dropping, upon, dropping on the fears that m monetary policy will get tighter. Um, same thing that happened in 2013, 2014, 2015. It was dropping on fears that monetary policy would get tighter. And the day, or maybe the week, but pretty close to the day that interest rates started to go up. Uh, it uh, it bottomed. And so the day that the Federal Reserve actually starts to taper, I believe will be the gold bottom again. And that's when we'll see gold start to take off because then you're not pricing in a future fear anymore. That's already been priced in. Now you're pricing in the future collapse that will lead to more easy monetary policy and gold starts to go up again. And that's when the shorts start closing out again. Um, and then at that point, you also have central banks really start to say, okay, well, what if the dollar loses reserve status? We need to make sure we have uh, you know, good balance sheets. We need to start picking up more gold, even though they already have a lot of gold. And so um, that's when I think we see the, the really parabolic move in gold start to take off once central banks start to take that seriously. All right. Well, um, I, I think we both want to talk more to you, uh, but just like gold, uh, you have a precious amount of time. <laughs> uh, there's also lots of questions I want to ask you about DeFi, but that might uh, need to wait for another episode where we, of course, gladly uh, get you back on the show. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, think. people can check you out on Twitter at uh, Heresy Financial, I guess. Um, yep. They can also check out, of course, a YouTube channel, which uh, they will be linked also in the title and the description of this video. Um, is there any final words you want to share uh, to our uh, listeners and viewers? No, that's it. I really appreciate it. Um, it was a really fun conversation. And uh, I love getting the word out about stuff like this because uh, the more people that understand how money works, um, the better you can prepare yourself for the future. And the more people who are prepared, uh, the better that future will be. On that Amazing. note. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you have enjoyed this episode of the Gold Republic podcast, of course, feel free to uh, give it a like. Uh, please subscribe if you haven't already. And if you have a comment or question, feel free to put it in the comment section, of course. This is for the YouTube viewers, Alexei. Well, and if you're actually listening to our podcast on any other podcast platform, you can also leave us a review. It helps other people to find us and also share it to any other person you find this content relevant to.